Hello there, it's Queensland Storyteller time. I'm Kim Dodsworth. I've got another great Australian short story for you today. It's by Elizabeth Jolly. One of Australia's best loved writers, she wrote with a gentle touch and a deep understanding of human nature. Today's story, Pear Tree Dance, is from Learning to Dance, Elizabeth Jolly, Her Life and Work, published by Penguin this year. No one knew where the newspaper of Claremont Street went in her spare time. Newspaper, or weekly as she was called by those who knew her, earned her living by cleaning other people's houses. There was something she wanted to do more than anything else, and for this she needed money. For a long time she had been saving, putting money aside in little amounts. Every morning when she woke up, she thought about her money. The growing sum danced before her, growing a little more. She calculated what she would be able to put in the bank. She was not very quick at arithmetic. As she lay in bed, she used the sky as a blackboard and in her mind wrote the figures on the clouds. The total sum came out somewhere halfway down her window. While she was working in the different houses, she sang. The bells of hell go ting-a-ling-a-ling for you and not for me. She liked hymns best. Well, how are we? She called out when she went in in the mornings. How's everybody today? And she would throw open windows and start pulling the stove to pieces. She knew everything about all the people she cleaned for, and she never missed anything that was going on. I think that word should be clay. C-L-A-Y. She helped old Mr Kingston with his crossword puzzle. Chatham's girls engaged at long last, she reported to the Kingstons. Two rooms full of presents. You should just see. Kingston boys had horrible accident. She described the details to the Chathams. Lost his job first, poor boy. Poor Mrs Kingston. Weakly sadly shook the tablecloth over the floor and carried out some dead roses carefully as if to keep them for the next funeral. I could not do without thee, saviour of the lost, she sang at the Butterworths. She cleaned in all sorts of houses. Her body was hard like a board and withered with so much work she seemed to have stopped looking like a woman. On her way home from work, she always went in the little shop at the end of Claremont Street and bought a few things, taking her time and seeing who was there and watching what they bought. Here's the newspaper of Claremont Street. The two shop girls nudged each other. Any pigs been eating babies lately, newspaper? One of them called out. What happened to the man who sawed off all his fingers at the timber mill? The other girl called out. You never finished telling us. No one needed to read anything. The newspaper of Claremont Street told them all the news. One Tuesday afternoon when she'd finished her work, she went to look at the valley for the first time. All the morning she was thinking about the long drive. She wondered which would be the shortest way to get to this place, hidden behind the pastures and foothills along the southwest highway. It was a strain thinking about it and talking gossip at the same time, especially as she kept thinking, too, that she had no right really to go looking at land. All land is somebody's land. For weekly, the thought of possessing some seemed more of an impertinence than a possibility. Perhaps this was because she had spent her childhood in a slaty backyard where nothing would grow except thin carrots and a few sunflowers. All round the place where she lived, the slag heaps smouldered and hot cinders fell on the paths. The children gathered to play in a little thicket of stunted thorn bushes and elderberry trees. There were patches of colt's foot, and they picked the yellow flowers eagerly till none was left. Back home in the black country, where it was all coal mines and brick kilns and iron foundries, her family had never had a house or a garden. Weakly had nothing behind her, not even the place where she was born. It no longer existed. As soon as she was old enough, she was sent into service. Later, she left her country with the family where she was employed. All her life she had done domestic work. She was neat and quick and clean, and her hands were rough like nutmeg graters, and she knew all there was to know about people and their ways of living. Every Sunday she went out to look at the valley, and every time she found something fresh. Once she noticed that on one side of the road was a whole long hedge of white wild roses. 
Another time it seemed as if sheep were on the hillside among the pigsties, but when she climbed up she saw it was only the light on some greyish bushes making them look like a quiet flock of sheep. If you're prepared to go out, say, forty miles, Mr. Rusk, the land agent, had said gently, there's a nice five acres with a tin shack for tools. Some of its river flats, suitable for pears. That'll be within your price range. Mr. Rusk spoke seriously to the old woman, even though he was not sure that she was all right in the head. Think it over, he advised. He always regarded a customer as a buyer until the customer did not buy. On Sunday, Weekly went to look at the five acres. It was more lovely than she had expected, and fragrant. A great many tall trees had been left standing, and the tin shack turned out to be a tiny weatherboard cottage. She was afraid she had come to the wrong place. It must be somebody's home, she thought to herself, as she peered timidly through the cottage window and saw that it was full of furniture. Disappointment crept over her. Purple pig face was growing everywhere, and from the high veranda she looked across the narrow valley to a hayfield between big trees. There was such a stillness that Weakley felt more than ever that she was trespassing, not only on the land, but into the very depths of the stillness itself. Mr. Rusk said that it was the five acres he had meant. I've never been there myself, he explained when she told him about the cottage. Everything's included in the price. Buying land takes time, but Weakley contained herself in silence and patience, working hard all the days. She began to buy things, a spade, rubber boots, some candles and groceries and polish, and she packed them into the old car. Last of all, she bought a pear tree. It looked so wizened, she wondered how it could ever grow. Carefully, she wrapped it in wet newspapers and laid it like a thin baby along the back seat. On the day Mr. Russ gave her the key, Weakley went to work with it pinned inside her dress. She felt it against her rims all morning, and in the afternoon she drove out to her piece of land. The same trees and fragrance and the cottage were all there as before. This time she noticed honeysuckle and roses, a fig tree and a hedge of rosemary, all neglected now and waiting for her to continue what some other person had started many years ago. She thought she would die there that first day as she opened the cottage door to look inside. She looked shyly at the tiny rooms and wandered about on the land looking at it and breathing the warm fragrance. The noise of the magpies poured into the stillness and she could hear the creek in flood running. She sank down onto the earth as if she would never get up from it again. She counted over the treasures of the cottage. After having nothing, she seemed now to have everything. A bed, table, chairs, and in the kitchen, a wood stove and two toasting forks, a kettle and five flat irons. There was a painted cupboard, too, and someone had made curtains of pale blue stuff patterned with roses. Weakley wanted to clean out the cottage at once. She felt suddenly too tired. She rested on the earth and looked about her, feeling the earth with her hands and listening as if she expected some great wisdom to come to her from the quiet trees and the undergrowth of the bush. At about five o'clock the sun, before falling into the scrub, flooded the slope from the west and reddened the white bark of the trees. The sky deepened with the coming evening. Weakly forced her crooked old feet into the new rubber boots. She took the spade and the thin pear tree and went down to the mud flats at the bottom of her land. Choosing a place for the pear tree, she dug a hole. It was harder to dig in the clay than she thought it would be, and she had to pause to rest several times. She carried some dark earth from under a fallen tree over to the hole. Carefully, she held the little tree in position and scattered the dark, soft earth round the roots. She shook the little tree and scattered in more earth, and then she firmed the soil, treading gently round and round the tree. For the first time in her life, the newspaper of Claremont Street, or weekly as she was called, was dancing. Stepping round and round the little tree, she imagined herself to be like a bride, dancing with lacy white blossom cascading on all sides. Round and round the tree, dancing, firming the softly yielding earth with her new boots. 
and from the little foil label blowing in the restlessness of the evening came a fragile music for the pear tree dance. And that was Pear Tree Dance by Elizabeth Jolly. I'll be looking forward to seeing you this time next week. I'm Kim Dodsworth. Bye for now.